Some people are motivated by desperate situations. A famous paratrooper was speaking to a group of young recruits. When he had finished his prepared talk and called for questions, one young fellow raised his hand and said, What made you decide to take your first jump? The paratrooper's answer was quick and to the point. An airplane at 20,000 feet with three dead engines. I think we'd all agree that that is a desperate time and it would call for desperate measures. Most situations that we think of in reference to desperate times have to do with financial struggles. We don't know if we'll have all the money to pay our bills or to put food on the table. Oftentimes they're very physical and obvious things that we associate with desperate times. However, there is a whole other area of our lives that we do not pay enough attention to until it hits a point of desperation. That is our spiritual life and our relationship with God. Whether the man in the illustration I just mentioned was a Christian or not, I do not know. However, I would almost agree that he and every individual on that plane said something to the effect of, God help us, before they made their leap from that plane. Last week we began a look at the minor prophet Joel. And in case you didn't notice, we are never told exactly what the Israelite people did to bring such a plague and judgment against themselves. This is quite unusual for the prophets. But as the brilliant biblical scholars we are, we can deduce that they simply were following into their typical pattern. As I mentioned last week, if we think we, the church, are totally different from the Israelites and totally unable to fall into a similar pattern, then we are sorely mistaken. However, it appears that there are those who believe this. There are certainly those who have tried to rewrite scripture, or at the very least, extract the inconvenient parts to better fit their lifestyle and their seeker-sensitive message. But when we take away from scripture, all we are doing is destroying its value and its efficacy in dealing with our lives. Let us continue in Joel chapter 2 and see what we ought to do in those desperate times. And frankly, at all times, please stand with me for the reading of the word. Joel chapter 2, beginning in the first verse. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. Like dawn spreading across the mountains, a large and mighty army comes, such as never was seen in ancient times, nor will ever be in ages to come. Before them, fire devours. Behind them, a flame blazes. Before them, the land is like the Garden of Eden. Behind them, a desert waste. Nothing escapes them. They have the appearance of horses. They gallop along like cavalry, with a noise like that of chariots. They leap over the mountaintops, like a crackling fire consuming stubble, like a mighty army drawn up for battle. At the sight of them, nations are in anguish. Every face turns pale. They charge like warriors. They scale walls like soldiers. They all march in line, not swerving from their course. They do not jostle each other. Each marches straight ahead. They plunge through defenses without breaking ranks. They rush upon the city. They run along the wall. They climb into the houses like thieves. They enter through the windows. Before them, the earth shakes. The heavens tremble. The sun and the moon are darkened. And the stars no longer shine. The Lord thunders at the head of his army. His forces are beyond number, and mighty is the army that obeys his command. The day of the Lord is great. It is dreadful. Who can endure it? 
Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, consecrate the assembly, bring together the elders, gather the children, those nursing at the breast, let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priest who minister before the Lord weep between the portico and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Father, we thank you for your word and your prophet Joel, how he spoke so effectively and so efficiently of the times that the people of Israel were facing. But Father, help us to extract from it what you would have for us today. Help us to be open to your word, and to your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> to recap from last week, the first chapter of Joel was calling out to all people in Israel to wake up. The farmers, the vine growers, the priests, the elders, the drunkards, and all who lived in the land. For what they were facing was of historical greatness. They have never experienced something like this before, and therefore they were called to a holy fast, a sacred assembly, and to repentance for the day of the Lord. Judgment day was fast approaching, and it will be much worse than what they are currently experiencing. But now in chapter 2, to blow the trumpet and to sound the alarm would to be to sound the bomb raid sirens during World War II in Britain or even during the Cold War in America. When the people in the city and surrounding the city heard the trumpet and the alarm, they would have immediately been set into action. They would either flee inwards if they lived outside of the main city or were not part of the army. Or if they were, they would grab their weapons and run to the outer edge to fight and protect. But no matter which physical response, everyone would have the same emotional response of fear and trembling. Now, in specific reference to the prophecy of Joel, it is not a foreign army of men that is afoot, but the army of locusts. But both of these things are known instruments that God uses to chasten those who are in opposition and rebellion. In this case, it's not the pagans or the Gentiles who are facing, facing the, the chastening of God, but it's his own chosen people. The day of the Lord is coming, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. It will appear like the suddenness of dawn as it spreads quickly across the land. This army is unlike anything they have ever seen before or will ever be or will ever be seen in the future. It is truly one of a kind. With fire leading them and flames following behind. Ahead of them the land is like a beautiful garden of Eden, but behind them all that's left is a desert wasteland. Nothing can or will escape. What a bleak and utterly desperate prophecy for the people of Israel. What can they do now? What hope do they have left? Yet Joel wasn't quite done with his depiction of the locust army plague. He says at the very sight of them, nations are in anguish, knowing there is nothing they can do. Faces turn pale at the sheer volume and visible destruction as they charge forth like warriors, scaling every wall like soldiers, never straying from the course. So disciplined that one does not trip 
or stumble or cause their neighbor to be jostled. Each carrying out their task, rushing upon the city, scaling the walls, climbing into houses through the windows like a thief, pillaging and plundering everything in sight. Their attack is powerful and swift, rushing throughout the city totally unrestricted and unhindered. But here's where things get interesting. Who is the one who causes the earth to shake and the heavens to tremble? The sun and the moon to be darkened and the stars to no longer shine. No one but the Lord can cause such things. Amen. Which brings verse 11 into a whole new light. The Lord thunders at the head of his army. Now, when I first read this passage, I thought, well, it must be the army of Israel that the Lord is thundering over and that they are following his word. But when you take a closer look, you realize that Joel is not talking about the Israelite army here. There is no mention of the army of Israel preparing to fight back. This is the army of locusts. That the Lord is commanding and thundering over and who is responding to his every word. But this army of locusts is also a foreshadowing of the Assyrian army, which will be coming in due course to rule over the Israelites as well. Mighty is the army that obeys his command. This sounds like a bit of a jab with a twist of the sword or knife. Basically saying, Israel, the army that obeys the Lord is mighty. So this could have been you, but instead, it's the army coming to destroy you. Who can endure it? The short answer, no one. So if no one can endure it, then there must be a point at which they have no hope. So what can they do? Why would they try to do anything? Well, verse 12 says, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. But why? We aren't going to make it out of this, so it doesn't matter what we do in regards to God. I can only imagine that this was part of the dialogue or the thought process that was taking place among the Israelites in that day. The attitude of a criminal who knows they're already in trouble. Maybe it's one who has already been sentenced to life in prison or to execution. They have nothing left to lose. So what they do next doesn't matter in the slightest, as it won't change the outcome. Imagine there are people like that, not just America today, but inside the church in America today. They may believe that we are too far gone, and that everything is going to hell in a handbasket, so what is the use in even trying? Obviously, they haven't heard, or at the very least, they haven't understood what the Lord has declared. Even now, in the midst of the impending doom, in the midst of the army that is rushing towards you like dawn rushes across the plains and over the mountains, even now, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. This phrase spoken by God shows his concern for his people and his desire to rescue them, even from the army that is already on their doorstep. In other words, it is never too late to return to God in this life. But it must be more than an outward ritual. It has to be with all your heart with fasting and weeping and mourning. 
And we know that this would not be without good cause or for no good reason because Joel reminds us of, of God's graciousness, his compassion, that he is slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. How long have they strayed to where God has been pushed to this point? How long have they rejected and denied God to where he has finally had enough? And has sent the locust army. And yet, even though he's been pushed to that point where they rejected him so long, he says, even now, if you would just return to me, I'll take it away. I'll turn the locust army around and send them away. I'll turn the Assyrian army around and send them away. Any other God of any other world religion would never relent from sending calamity, for they are not loving, gracious, compassionate, or slow to anger, or abounding in love. It's only the God that we serve who desires for his people and all people to be in right relationship with him. Therefore, he relents even when his anger and wrath is just. Beginning in verse 15, we get a glimpse or a flashback back to chapter 1. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the assembly. Bring together the elders. Gather the children, those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room in the bride her chamber. Let the priest who minister before the Lord weep between the portico and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, Lord. Do not make our inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? This is the way that we will see a change in the church in America. When we fast, when we call a sacred assembly of believers of all ages, consecrating that assembly to God with one purpose of repenting. For we do not want our inheritance to be that which people laugh and scoff about, saying, where is their God? While we perish at the hands of the coming army. We are in this phase of history right now, where if we are paying attention, we see the army forming in the distance, and it's progressively marching toward us at a quickening pace. We are in a desperate situation, and it's time to get motivated. We have a choice to make. Do we accept our demise and destruction, or do we call out to our God, repenting and weeping for him to relent? I do not think any of us want to see the church face this destruction. And I, do, I, do, I understand that we do not have influence over all the churches in America. But we do have influences in our church and with the people in our areas. When a local church is serving God, things happen and people notice. Church, let's be a local church that serves God, not ourselves. A church that serves God and not a political ideation or party. A church that serves God and seeks the lost. A church that serves God and builds up mature and holy believers. That's the kind of church I want to be a part of. And the kind of church that I want to lead. But it takes more than just me. It takes more than just the individuals on their own, but it takes the collective to cry out to God on the path of our church, 
on the behalf of our district, of our region, of our denomination, but on behalf of all the churches in America. Right now, there is a lawsuit pending of a pastor who has come out as transgender, who was fired from their church for such things, and is now suing the church for wrongful termination. That's what we're facing. And if that gets into the hands of the wrong court, God help that church. Because they're seeking $200,000 in damages. And the last time I checked, most churches don't have $200,000 to throw away. But this is the stuff that is raging across America. We think, oh, well, it's out there. No, it is in here. It is behind the pulpit of so many of our churches. Look at our brothers and sisters in the Methodist church. How they go through an entire assembly and they vote to stay conservative. And now that's not good enough. And so they continue to split. And in the process, the conservative churches are the ones who are taking the financial blows. God, help us. Amen. To go to the word, to go to the full word, and not to take our exacto knife and start cutting out the passages that we don't like, cutting out the passages that convict us. Because then all we're doing is making the word our own little idol that we've created. Help us to understand the full gospel. Help us to understand that we are a wretched people needing a savior. Amen. Needing our God to act on our behalf. And I believe that he will. I know that he will if we will be faithful, if we will call out to him, asking and pleading for his relentance, because that's the God we serve. Even now, return to me with all your heart. Amen. Rend your heart, not your garments. It's got to be more than an outward ritual, but it's got to be from the heart, from the very core of our very being. We're in desperate times, and it calls for desperate measures. I don't think any of us need to go out and, and do anything crazy unless that crazy thing is to proclaim the gospel. Unless that crazy thing is to call sin, sin, and to repent of our own misdeeds, and to fall on our face before God and ask and plead for his forgiveness. Those are the things we need to do. Call our brothers and sisters back to the full gospel. Call our friends and families into the fold so that they may see the face of God. Let's stand. Father, there's many who try to avoid the Old Testament. Many who try to avoid the prophets. Because they fear if they give credence to the prophets or if they give any time that they will see themselves depicted on the very pages of scripture. But Father, we are not a church who 
strays from the Old Testament, or a, a church that wants to be in fear of seeing ourselves depicted, but we know that we are depicted in all the pages of Scripture. Because mankind has never changed. From the moment that sin entered the world, we have been selfish, greedy, self-centered people. And yet you have reached out your hand to us time after time after time. Calling us back to you, wooing us back to you, sending blessings upon blessings, mercy upon mercies. Giving us so much grace. And Father, just as Joel called the people of Israel to repent and to flee back to you, Father, we call the church today to repent and to flee back to you, to the full gospel. For we want to see revival. We cry out for revival. We desire it in our hearts. But Lord, let, us, let it start with us. Let it start with me, in me, so that it may be the fire that spreads throughout the believers. And people will see your hand at work. Father, we pray for your blessings your mercy and your grace, the courage and the wisdom and the strength that you give us. May it be imparted upon us as we leave this place each and every day until we meet again to hear your word once more. Father, we ask all these things in the precious, magnificent, powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.